Welcome to the Talent Equation Podcast. If you are passionate about helping young people to unleash their potential and want to find ways to do that better, then you've come to the right place. The Talent Equation Podcast seeks to answer the important questions facing parents, coaches, and talent developers as they try to help young people become the best they can be. This is a series of unscripted, unpolished conversations between people at the razor's edge of the talent community who are prepared to share their knowledge, experiences, and challenges in an effort to help others get better faster. Listen, reflect, and don't forget to join the discussion at thetalentequation.co.uk. Enjoy the show. I'm delighted to welcome Ben Galloway to The Talent Equation. Ben, welcome. Stu, thanks so much for having us. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and have a chat. Um. We uh, just so full disclosure for the audience, we've been having some serious technical difficulties um, with uh, mostly through my um, uh, significant lack of skill uh, with uh, editing software and recording <laughs> software. Um, so Ben's been very patient and uh, we, we but we're um, we're going to we're going to give it a go again. Um, ben, so uh, you have exploded into the uh, social media and YouTube space in particular with your uh, fantastic videos that you produce through um, through opposite direction. Um, some people, though. Uh, particularly if they've been uh, living in a cave or something along those lines or hunkered down through the the uh, mini ice age that we're having over here in the UK, um, may not have seen some of those videos. So um, I wonder if you could tell everybody really about kind of what's the story, what's your story, what's the, what, what, how did you get to where you are today um, and doing what you're doing and sharing the brilliant stuff that you're sharing? Yes, yeah, true. Um... Look, it all started back when I was a kid, as as with lots of coaches and lots of people who love sport, backyard games, playing on the street. Um, anyone who knows me really well knows that I believe that I had the best childhood ever. I had four older brothers, three um, kids on the same street that were the same age as me, and we had about 10 people that would engage in these games, and we had all kinds of games that we played. My favorite was um, Jump Fences, Capture the Flag. So it'd be someone, we had one of our mates, um, backyards which was about five doors down from mine and on the opposite side of the street there was another person so you had like a side of the street each and we'd jump over fences and oh, it was mental it was it was one of the greatest backyard games um, some neighbors didn't like the fact that we would run through their backyards and whatnot but hey little kids we did whatever we wanted <laughs> that's that's got to be what you do i guess I, I for me i think that's um that's that's i think what every neighborhood should be like and i feel very sad that it isn't like that at the moment yeah no for sure um and i'm a big advocate to try and as much as possible bring that back and we've got to have ways and, and attempt to as much as possible bring that back um so from there from my childhood i went through school playing lots of organized sport um try i played cricket and football um at uh, like an average level um Never, never really got to the highest level. Um, and then uh, I started my undergraduate in exercise science in, in PE teaching, a dual degree, with um, people like Ian Renshaw running it. Um, Keith Davids had just, or was starting to move away from QUT, but he obviously had already influenced a lot of people at, at QUT already. Brendan Moy was one of my first tutors, and, and um, Lee Wharton, as as well along the way and these guys started to to push this constraints based approach and i think it it really hammered home for me when ian was having we had a lecture and he was comparing constraints to backyard games and i realized how much i love backyard games and how much of an impact that i had on my life um throughout my childhood and and how much i wanted to give that opportunity to other people so I was, I was thinking, well, we can merge constraints-based learning, backyard games, and bring that into PE, and bring that into coaching. So that's what I attempted to do. Um, I was coaching all through my undergraduate degree, um, for, uh, at least well, 10 to be five sessions a week, getting to schools, clubs, wherever I could coach, I would try, try and coach with them. Um, and then I finished my degree, and I ended up going to India 
with my best mate. We we went into a flight center, wanted to go for one month, ended up going for four months or three and a half months. Um, Sri Lanka, India, Nepal, the big trek. And what an amazing experience that was. Um, before I had had a slight meeting with Ian and Brendan just to talk about potentially going into research, but not nothing cemented. And then when I was over there, I was thinking more about it and I actually did my research proposal and a CV um, at like three o'clock in the morning before we hiked Annapurna Circuit um, and sent that to Ian so I could get a tutoring job. And in my CV, I wrote, mate, I'm a dedicated guy. I'm writing this at two, two o'clock in the morning about to do the Annapurna circuit for 12 days. So give us a job, please, or some, something <laughs> along those lines. Um, and he, he hooked me up with a, with a role. And then I dove into research, something which I never thought I would do. My dad's a professor. I, I never thought I would get into to doing research, but it ended up being that way. Um, and then with that came the opportunity to work in the community club, the local community club. I had amazing mentors there, Remo Buse and David De Silva, two guys that have given me so much and helped my coaching over the years. Um, they gave me the opportunity to do some coach education through UQ. Um, and that's where Opposite Direction kind of got born from. I was talking about constraints to people and I was getting frustrated um, with their lack of understanding of what I was trying to explain to them. It's a difficult thing to explain. So I thought that I'd make these videos as a tool I shared them on my normal YouTube channel. Then I shared it on Twitter. Just thought, oh, I'd see what see what happens, see what people think. Got a, got a few hits, so I decided I'll make opposite direction and delve deeper into ecological approach and let other people explore it with me. Um, so I guess that's where I am at the moment. And um, the response to those videos, um, I guess, did it take you by surprise? Uh, I uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I look at it a little bit as self-determination theory for me because um, I got very intrinsically motivated after I got responses from people um, and there was that idea of relatedness coming. I, I had the autonomy of what I made and how I made it. I had the competence and, and the success came from the amount of views that it got, but then the relatedness really hit home when people started sending me emails or people wanted to get in touch like yourself or well, Marco Sullivan sent me some emails, um, Play Development Project asked if I want to write a blog for them. So it was a great opportunity to connect with these people. And, and yeah, it, it grew from there. Um, I mean, I, I was thinking about this, um, you know, reflecting on, you know, th those of us who are, you know, if you like, content providers in this particular domain. And it strikes me that um, I sort of feel as if, certainly from the feedback I get from people who listen or, or, or read some of the stuff that I put out um, that there's been this, they seem to be that there's a real thirst for information on this and I get the sense that people are um, they're working away they're they've got a they've got a feeling that they can't quite put their finger on that that something isn't quite right that um, you know maybe what they're doing isn't quite working or their uh, the impact they're having isn't quite right the engagement they're getting isn't quite right that it doesn't seem to be that the you know participants are kind of getting a level of enjoyment and, and there's something in the back of their mind and then when they discover the constraints approach or you know an, an ecologically motivated or ecologically you know derived uh, approaches i think an awful lot falls into place for them there's quite a lot of aha moments and i certainly i'm certainly getting some of that feedback are you are you picking up that from from people who are responding to you yeah for sure um i love it when i get the emails i really really do like it or, or a message on twitter or, or wherever because for me i think a lot of that comes from them believing in themselves that they start to understand these concepts and when they understand that there's there really is a justification of why for why i'm doing this why i'm going to training what i'm trying to achieve um and i hope and I, i'm really glad that the videos are, are starting to give that to people um because you can get that little bit of knowledge that little bit of understanding of what you're trying to do and then you have the confidence now to go and experiment and put it into place before maybe there wasn't there like there wasn't the opportunity for much of that um and and drills are, all, are saturated all over the internet you look at youtube first five if you look up soccer drills youtube it'll be like passing around cones um which i are the bane of my existence um but i don't want to go too far into that 
<laughs> well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm laughing because um, I, yes, could very easily follow you, follow you into that rabbit hole. And I, there's been plenty said about that. But I suppose one thing that is worth uh, reflecting on, or I would be interested just to get your thoughts around, is um, we, we were chatting earlier on about um, your reflections of your experiences uh, in terms of as a participant around, you know, sort of being on the receiving end of a what you might call, um, you know, a, a kind of more of a, a drill based approach and that sort of stuff. And just, um, you know, you mentioned you you loved your backyard games and all that sort of stuff. And I think that probably serves as a significant motivation for you. I mean, I, I certainly did as well. Um, and I think those of us who loved and were fortunate enough to experience play uh, and that kind of uh, the, the, the joy of, you, you know, kind of youthful and, and childhood play, um, you know, most of us, I think one of the reasons I think we're so passionate about this particular approach, because I think it it blends that childhood passion with, uh, you know, um, coaching and skill acquisition. I, I think for a long time, people were under the misapprehension that sort of play and skill development were somehow at odds with each other. And no, 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 you have to do you have to you can't do all that f- you know, play stuff anymore. You've got to be serious and we've got to do some drills and some, you know, some more serious practices. And for me, what I am genuinely uh, committed to, one of the reasons I'm genuinely committed to this is that I actually think this is, this now uh, offers us the best of both worlds. We can genuinely enhance the capabilities of individuals whilst they have an absolute whale of a time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll touch on it briefly. Um, my coaching experience, I, I went straight into constraints. So my only experience of traditional approach was when I was a player. And then when I um, met Ian or when Ian was doing one of the lectures and he was comparing backyard games to constraints and my experience in backyard games was out of this world. Well, I thought, oh my goodness, this is a great opportunity. I want, I need kids to experience this. Like there's a deep desire for me to have people to have the same feeling that I had when I was a kid when I was playing those backyard games. Um, so yeah, like when I was doing traditional activities, the uh, and I'll be honest, the coaches are absolutely amazing people. They're people that I still try and keep in, in touch with as many of my coaches that I had throughout my childhood. And I've, I've tried to rekindle and, and go talk to those people um, and even give them some, some ideas about what I'm doing now and how I'm going about it and seeing if they want to move more into this direction. Um, but I think about it and I... I it was just boring. There was, there was, it was like, they, they had to motivate us. They had to say, well, this is going to make you a good player. Like that was, that was the motivation partly is, oh, this is, this is, you have to do this. If you want to succeed, you have to do this because it will make you better. Um, I, oh, the amount of times that at cricket, I would like, there was this balancing beam and we'd hit a ball off a tee and You'd fall off, like, it was a little bit constraints, but hitting the ball off the tee was just, oh, the back foot had to be planted. It was just so repetitive, so um, just boring, really. <laughs> and and I suppose that's that's actually one of my major drivers. I mean, you know, w- what I do, you know, for a living, I'm very fortunate to work in the business of sport, and I've always been very driven throughout my career on um, uh, two things, really. One is giving kids who've got some potential the chance to go as far as they can with their potential and try and remove some of the barriers that might limit them from doing that. Um, But also before all that even starts taking place, um, just open up opportunity and and get more people participating in sport. I mean, um, you know, where where you are in in Australia, I know things have changed slightly, but for a long time, you know, you're you're a very... um, a very kind of you know outdoor nation very sport driven uh you know it's very much sports very much part of the kind of sort of dominant culture um but like all western societies but certainly in in the uk i mean we're seeing some real challenges with uh activity levels sort of decreasing steadily um really quite alarming rates we've obviously got challenges with childhood obesity um We've got challenges with technology where, you know, children are spending increasing amounts of time, um, you know, engaged by by screens. Um, We've got uh, and we've got a number of different societal issues. And I know it's the same. I know it's the same for you. Um, But uh, in order to reverse that, in my opinion, um, we have to have a I'm going to use some 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 language, but um, we have to have a sports product 
um, or a physical activity product, which is um, at least as compelling, if not more compelling, as any of those other things that, that, that kids can be involved in now. And if you're telling me that um, the idea of we're going to stand on a beam, we're going to take, a, we're going to wait our turn, we're going to all be, um, you know, organised and structured, and we're going to do do all these sorts of things. So we're basically going to make sport a bit like school. Um, if you're telling me that that is the way forward in order to help us get a more active, physically active and engaged uh, group of young people, well, I'd love to see the evidence that that's absolutely that, that that that's exactly right. And secondly, even if there was really, really compelling evidence that that was the only way to develop talent and develop skill, um, I would want to uh, I would want to still explore different ways of doing this because. To be honest, for me, it's about, um, you know, childhood is about joy. It's about uh, exploration. It's about learning. It's about social interaction with others, all those sorts of things. And for me, I think the sports experience has just been completely robbed of that for years and years and years. So when I see videos like yours coming out, which talk about the underpinning, which hopefully then gives coaches something to hook on to, to say, do you know what? I think I need to do it in a different way because not only can I help these individuals experience something fantastic but also i can really help them learn and develop for me it's like that i keep saying this it's the ultimate win-win in sport yeah um yeah and i guess that's part of the reason why opposite direction was de developed because i wanted to help people or why i started doing the coach education i wanted people to understand that kids can have fun and learn or kids can have fun and develop at the same time it, it's not one is this and one is this it's they can be together um and it's and games and constraint space is a great opportunity to do that really a great opportunity it's a win win exactly it's funny you know um you said something earlier about motivation and how you'd have coaches and again you know we're not, i'm not going to i'm not i'm not criticizing individuals um because for a long, long time, there just wasn't any information. They were only going on what they were taught. In if they'd been, you know, if they'd been on a coach education course, this is what you get taught. Mm. So of course, if this is what you're going to be doing. Um, uh, but again, on even on a coach education course, it's largely technical and tactical in nature. So it doesn't necessarily tell you how to engage thirty children uh, of mixed ability groups. Um, so anyway. Um, but, you know, you mentioned motivation earlier on where they're saying the way to motivate you is to say, look, you've got to do this to get better. Well, n no more readily is that the one I used to hear and I shame faced. I used myself for several years was we're going to do this. And then if you do it really well, we can have a game. <laughs> or, or my fav my favorite is this might not be that fun, but it's going to help you. Like <laughs> As a kid. If someone says this is not going to be fun, I've switched off straight away. Yeah. I'm going, what, mate? <laughs> and and so that's, for me, the, the beauty of this, because with a bit of creativity and a bit of imagination, we can do things that is going to uh, absolutely... You know, you're gonna you're gonna have fun dialed up to the max, and you're gonna have development dialed up to the max as well. So for me, that's uh, you know that that's that this is just a journey that I'm I'm going to continue to explore down because um, you know I've got those two driving motivations as as kind of you know central to to what I'm doing when I'm working with young people. Therefore, uh, I can't come off the path now. You know, I've as I keep saying, you know, I've I've taken the blue pill. So so here we are. Yeah, for sure. Well, just to continue quickly on that, um, when I did one of my, I did a presentation at the, at the state conference for football, and I started with a, a poem about backyard games, about my backyard experience, and how how it was about doing everything, playing Star Wars, doing all these things. And then I, I stopped and I said to the guys, "Okay, I want you to talk to the people next to you. Talk to the person next to you about the backyard games." And I gave them some questions. Was your backyard games competitive? Um, how did it, how did it feel when you were playing? Did you have a freedom of expression while you were playing those backyard games? And the room erupted. Ten minutes, they couldn't stop talking. They were talking about what they did, how they played the games on the street and stuff like that. And I was trying to get them to stop, and I couldn't get them to stop talking. Um, so that emotional connection from coaches, I think, is a great opportunity. Let's get them to buy and Let's get them to... Like, a lot of people coach because they had a great experience in sport. Well, they probably also had a great experience in, in backyard games or street games. Um, because that's what people did back in those days as kids. So trying to engage with those coaches about that and getting to have like an emotional connection, feeling that 
oh, this is why I love sport, is um, I think a good way to approach it. That that's fantastic, actually. That's something I'm gonna I'm gonna steal. Thank you. <laughs> in, in our learning, um, I think because I do a lot of these kinds of coach education courses, and I, I very often have sessions, particularly talking about um, I run a particular workshop called Engaging Games for Children, which talks about this very concept. And I nearly always have at least two or three dissenting voices. You know, well. If you don't give them the basic skills, how can they play the game? And, you know, and oh, you've got to do drills, otherwise they will never develop the techniques and all these sorts of things. But actually, if the starting point was, tell me about all those games you used to play as kids in the street or with your friends and this, that and the other, and get them really emotionally, you know, uh, telling their stories about that sort of thing. You can always then refer back to that emotional connection. Surely you want children to have the emotional connection that you had, don't you? Yeah, it's really power. It's really powerful. Yeah, for sure. That 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 was, I guess, my approach because I just knew that that's what drives me. That is 100% what drives me. My connection to what I did when I was a kid is what drives me and why I study what I do now and why I do what I do now. And I would love to give that opportunity to other people. So um, in terms of wh what you're doing now, you, one of the things we were talking about earlier on is, um, you know, you, you, I'm very envious, I think, because you've never known anything else. You've never experienced, as a coach, the purgatory of working in a different way, uh, and you've got nothing to unlearn. I've had to do all that kind of painful unlearning process. I, I described the first, uh, I mean, I qualified as a level three coach. Uh, I was relatively young. I was about 24, 25. So that's, um, you know, um, decades and decades ago. Um, but uh you know I, I don't know how i did that because um you know i was a level three in terms of i had a piece of paper saying i was a level three but i had no way near the a level of coaching skill to go and i went through what i describe as the wilderness years where i made an awful <laughs> lot of mistakes and if anybody i was coaching then i'm i'm going to do it again i'm going to make a public apology on this podcast to you now because <laughs> some of the challenges and some of the difficulties that i experienced one of the reasons i do this podcast is so people don't have to go through that yeah. you on the other hand you've never known anything else you're exploring this wonderful world of constraints so i'm very envious of you yeah i, I it was really interesting i went to um i was started my football um education and i went to do my c license and i'm actually currently doing my b license um in the ffa model but i went on my c license and i was i was frustrated because i'd been doing all this work at university um and i was learning constraints and i was like fully into it like I was loving it and then I went to the FFA and it kind of moved away on this C license course on this coaching course and I was really excited to go and then I got there and I was frustrated I was so frustrated and I guess that's also another reason why I moved into the masters is because I didn't see the coaches and licenses that I was going to receive at at this present stage as the opportunity for me to improve as a coach I could get to my A license or my B license or whatever but I wouldn't be at the same level of understanding that I am right now because I've delved into my masters and, and looked at it and delved into these podcasts, this informal learning that's everywhere on the internet. There's um, blogs and everything, just hearing other people's experiences. That is such a powerful way to um, learn and to interact and to develop. And I'm, I'm very privileged, very, uh, yeah, I'm privileged to be at the stage where I am, to have had the mentors that I had. Um, that gave me the opportunity to explore and, and basically said, Benny, you have you have a blank canvas here. I didn't have someone looking over my shoulder saying, what are you doing here? Why are you doing this? What are you doing that? I, it was more, there was so much support around me that I got that opportunity. And yeah, I, I now want as well as developing to give some of that back. It, it, that's a really interesting uh, in, insight, actually. And, and I think... Um... There'll be a, I think there might be quite a lot of people listening to this podcast who will be nodding along or even, you know, banging the steering wheel if they're driving going, yes, yes, because I think there I think you'll find that a lot of people resonate with that experience around their formal education. Um, I think most people uh, see formal coach education as really a kind of means by which to get, you know, your kind of accreditation. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's like. Um, uh, it's like just getting over the hurdle, you know, to be able to then go to the next stage or to get, you know, to get employment somewhere or whatever it is. It's it's very base level. It really doesn't, I don't think anyway, or should never be given as a mark of expertise. Because for me, 
expertise is um, you should you should people should watch you they should talk to you they should understand your philosophy they should understand your underpinning uh, justification for what you're doing that's what um, really delineates those people who've got really high quality expertise and anybody who just looks at somebody's piece of paper and goes right come on in and work in my my facility please don't do that because those qualifications really you can have a massive wide range of ability in in two people who've got the same on paper qualification yeah for sure, for sure. so i think you're right by the way to um to start to take uh, your learning from other places because i think like you say it never i mean it is the the, the space is so rich I, I i mentor a lot of young coaches and they quite often say to me oh what should i read or or have you got anything you can send me and i just go no um <laughs> Just, just go out there. There's, there's loads. Jump on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I used I, to have to go and read books and stuff. <laughs> hey, I still read books. I still enjoy going to the library and picking up a random book and and reading some of the things about coaching. Um, there's lots to learn. Oh no, you're right. And don't get me wrong. Um, I think for me again, I mean, my library. I've got. I'm one of those people, probably a bit like you. I've got four books on the go, uh, yeah. you know, at any one time. Um, and I still. It is, yeah. I still enjoy. I still enjoy that as a as a means of reading. What I'm saying is that was the only source of information when I was sort of on my, in my early stages of coach development. You know, and you were lucky if you. I stumbled across teaching games for understanding, um, yeah. and that that took me on a bit of a journey. Anyway, shifting gears, um, you're doing some interesting research. Uh, tell me more. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, working with Ian Renshaw and, and Brendan Moy, and I'm looking at um, adaptable dribblers. Um, and we're looking at from the point of view of constraints-based games and control parameters. And those control parameters are, are being um, or looked at through the systematic approach, which is game intensity index. So game intensity index is we look at the number of players on a field. So we divide, um, we have the player numbers, divide, uh, the field size divided by the player numbers. And that gives us uh, a, ra a, a space per player, if that makes sense. Um, so what happened, what the idea behind it in, in terms of intensity is there's more football interactions using Marco Sullivan's term, but there's more football interactions occurring when, um, there is a, a smaller space with more numbers. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, my research, um, is just to look at how to start off with my first two studies are. We're going to change the size of the field and we're just going to look at how the dribbling behaviors change with the players. And I'm working with, uh, I think, 10 and 11 year old kids. And then, um, this, yeah, and then the, second, and the second study will be looking at um, the, so, uh, the number of players on the sizes. Okay, so you're basically going to count somehow the number of game interactions yep. based on purely the, the 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 manipulation of one constraint which is pitch size yep and then sorry what was the second one uh number of players on the field okay and then uh, and then are you going to do a third one i i so i'm begging the question now but i imagine there's a third one of what happens if you do both <laughs> yep well it, it will naturally happen with the, the second one yeah oh of course it will yeah 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 um uh, but yeah for sure so um and how we're measuring that is by looking at the number of touches. So we're just going to focus on dribbling rather than looking at all the football interactions, just look at dribbling. And we've created a couple of different dribbling games. So a 1v0 dribbling game where people are dribbling in traffic and um, there's a task of trying to get back to a position as fast as possible, but there's eight other people dribbling in the same game at the same time. There's another task where it's just a 1v1 with... Um, keeping possession in a square, and then there's a third task, which is trying to beat the player. Um, that's, I guess, where my interest lies at the moment in terms of football. I think in Australia, definitely, where because I, I think it also comes back to the fact that we don't have the backyard games and we don't have the expression and we're coaching them out of, of and into team games too early, that we're not developing that dribbling ability with our players. Um, I, I would... Uh, I would entirely concur. Um, so I'm in a, you know, a, a slightly different but related domain in field hockey, and um, you know, it's a, you know, it's essentially the same game except we manipulate the ball with sticks instead of feet. Yeah, um, and the ball, exactly. the ball is smaller, but it, the, the game is the same. The tactics the, are pretty much the same. The, the numbers are the same. Yeah, the principles of play are exactly the same. The invasion games, 
that's that's the principles of play do not change so you can play football rugby afl um hockey basketball i i like to what i love watching basketball because I, I like the ideas of some of the tactics that they use and and yeah. trying to use those tactics then in football um but yeah there's yeah. no difference um it, it's interesting um that uh in terms of dribbling um I, I totally agree with you about this and um what i see a lot of in both football and also in hockey is because one of the constraints on the coach a really interesting discussion with peter arnott um uh, a golf coach last week and um he was talking about how when he's in the win it's in the winter up in scotland and um things can get pretty pretty horrific um you know he tends to coach much more indoor and on rain on the range and he can feel himself getting more technical and and kind of much more about technique than about outcome and impact and all those sorts of things and i do think environmental constraints uh, whether they're social or whatever on coaches are really important in terms of the way that coaches behave so if you're driven by uh, a competitive outcome, um, i.e., you know, you're playing in a league or you're playing this with, with, you know, relatively young children, then surprise, surprise, you're going to get them to do football interactions that are going to give you the best chance of success. Yeah. So given that particularly young children may not have a particularly good amount of dribbling ability at that age, um, what do they do? OK, well, we're going to pass the ball a lot. So, of course, you know, the constraints on the coach driven by the competitive environment forced them into, e even if they were very constraints led in their approach, but it would be focusing on, we're going to pass the ball, we're going to pass the ball because it's going to give us best chance of success. And I totally agree that I see this a lot, by the way, that, you know, the, the idea of children running or carrying the ball, dr dribbling, running with the ball and getting tackled is frowned upon. Body language, everything is just no no that is that is an undesirable behavior yeah. whether it whether it's explicit or implicit it's an undesirable behavior you know you have lots of coaches doing two touch you have lots of coaches doing all these sorts of things in a in an effort to say to children that dribbling the ball is an undesirable behavior now for me we've got to stop all that and with the little ones that I've been working with for a long time, we have done, and I say this on my coach education courses, for the first two or three years I was working with them, and we're talking about six-year-olds, and we're mostly just, we're not playing competitively, we're just doing training games. All we did was dribbling. Mm. Because for me, lots and lots of exposure of carrying the ball and finding ways to, um, to you know, get from one place to another with an opponent in the way, I just thought they needed loads of times to have a go at that. Yeah, for sure. Um on the dribbling, I went to Spain um, for two weeks and I stayed um, with the technical director of Deportivo La Coruña. At the time, his name's Jose Bacalo, who's a really close friend of mine. And he's actually now moved to Brisbane and he's coaching in Brisbane. Um, and he introduced me to this idea of chasing games, um, which is right. both people have the ball and it's just tiggy, basically. Yeah. But we've got, there's balls, everyone's working with the ball at the same time. And it, it's really good. It, you might have seen one of my YouTube videos about it, but... It gets that dynamic. You're reacting to the to the defender. You're still getting away from the defender, but it also simplifies the task because the other yep. person has the ball there, so it's easier to get away. They have to also manipulate the ball to be able to to tag you. So, yeah, oh, those chasing games are probably some of the best games. I still use them. Like even working one of the elite programs that I work in at the moment, we do them every training session at the start of training. Um, and everyone enjoys them, loves doing it. You, you're always on the ball. You're always active. There's so much um, perception action going on while you're in the activity that you have to be dealing with. Um, you have to be, like, if you increase it to 2v2s where you have passing, then you're looking at the direction of the pass, the moment of the pass. You're looking at everything, and it's just it's a great way, I think, an amazing way to include the dribbling in with everything. I, I totally agree with you. Um interestingly um i've got a load of different um games they're basically just a, a single chase based game but with uh different variables thrown in and therefore i call it something different so for example we might start with a classic of truck and trailer um <laughs> which is one person having to be the trailer or the you know on the, the of, of yep. the truck and follow and around and stay as close yeah. as possible it's a yep. great that's a great game love it yeah and then we just just manipulate the influence, the, the the manipulate the the task constraint ever so slightly, uh, and then it becomes dogfight, 
So that's when one person is trying to shoot down the other one by getting their ball to um, hit the other person's foot. So not only does the person being chased have to manipulate the ball in front of them, they also have to be aware of what's behind them and be able to dodge away from that. Yeah, so, wow. Um, wow. Subtle variation, but it becomes a different a different game altogether. That, that yeah, wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> Do you have many stats? And again, uh, uh, well, um, not not particularly because obviously with a hockey ball it's smaller. Okay. Um, so uh, you don't get many people um, stumbling. But to be honest, um, I, I couldn't guarantee that they don't. <laughs> yeah, I'm just in my brain right now. I'm just thinking <laughs> someone getting their legs taken out with the ball. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, it's more of a kind of just sort of t- I, what I try and do is actually is instead of it, hit, I, don't, I don't let them whack it at them. They can't kick it or whack yeah, it. Okay. Uh, they have to kind of just sort of dribble it on there. Yeah. Um, and do that oh, kind of thing. So, okay. um, yeah. <laughs> I can just, just fun, someone yeah. on the other side of the field just whacking the ball. <laughs> <laughs> well, what they learn pretty quickly, you know what? I discovered this, actually. I don't have to normally uh, make that rule up because what they find is they whack the ball at their feet, they miss, and, and then they have to... to go running after the ball yeah. and come back in. Yeah, so um, awesome. the only reason I put the rule in is to stop them doing that because what they find, them, you know, they don't actually get very much out of the session by chasing after the ball and coming back. So uh, sometimes I have to put that rule in from the outset. But we've got yeah. loads of variations of truck and trailer like that, um, or not truck and trailer, but just variations like that because I think that me and my ball time is really important. That um that chasing the ball story reminds me of when I was playing in Nepal, um and this is at, like in altitude like three thousand up whatever and there's a cliff face, and there's like this little railing, but the passing on one side of the field was so soft because no and basically everyone just dribbled on that side because no one wanted the ball to go off the cliff because then there's no <laughs> ball, <laughs> so in, environmental constraints are so interesting in in that idea, so like there's the cliff face there okay we're not going to pass the ball that way at all because if we pass the ball it goes over a cliff we don't have a football we're never going to play again basically so have you seen that seen that video of the uh the village in somewhere like i think it's somewhere like thailand or somewhere malaysia where they they played football on a floating um a floating yeah, pitch that's so i love that that's so <laughs> awesome and recently there was a i saw a a rugby one in america i think and they'll the end zone was off the back of the field, so you scored all your tries by diving in and doing flips into the into the I've water. Seen that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> yeah, I think if people are interested in searching out that that uh, that floating pitch one, I think it's called Panyanyi or something like that. Um, I might try and dig it out, put it in a link in the show notes for people um, if they uh, if they want to find that one because it's a useful video actually. Um, so just drilling into this a bit more, drilling into your research a little bit more around adaptive dribblers. I just I just want to explore a couple of concepts with you because I think it's of um, it might be of particular interest. So um, I was having a bit of a discussion uh, on LinkedIn the other day with somebody who was talking about um, well. Uh, I've invited them to come and have this conversation on the podcast, but um, uh, they were talking about the idea of, uh, like, for example, teaching, you know, he's te- talking about teaching his son uh, stepovers. Um, and he used a, re- a reference, he used a point around, um, you know, basic skills. And he described basic skills as stepovers, Cruyff turns and pullbacks. Um, now, immediately in my mind, I got some kind of red flags around these are basic skills, are they? Okay, that's interesting. But he, he described to me an experience with his son where he taught him to do these stepovers. He was able to do them perfectly, but then he really struggled to do them in games because he was getting the timing wrong. And then over a period of time, he got them to a point where he got the timing right. And now he does the best step over out of anybody of his age group. And I thought to myself, well, for me, that is pretty indicative of what we're talking about here. Yeah. Um, because I, I thought to myself, well... Um, you know, stepovers, really. I mean, is that is that something we need? I don't know. I mean, surely that needs that's dependent. Anyway, just thought I'd watch throw Messi. that at you and my, my, just get your get your reflections. Yeah. My response to that would be watch Messi dribble. Um, he doesn't do too many stepovers. Um, and my other my other thing to that is Johan Cruyff in his in his autobiography, if he wrote it, I, I don't. I'm not 100 percent sure on that, but he talked about um, the Cruyff turn. And he said, I never practiced this. I never had done it before. I thought it was just a normal thing. It was the best uh, solution to the situation I was in at the moment. That's that's yeah. word for word what he said about the Cruyff turn. So um, I think when we look at adaptable dribbling and we look at these things, doing the step over, doing the Cruyff turn, these kind of moves will just come out naturally while we play. 
you might have seen um, from Player Development Project, um, the one about Blassie and the Blassie turn and how he developed that by playing a playground and he would get the defender to have to run around a slide and he'd flip the ball over the, the slide. And then he's using that in the Premier League, um, that same move. So what we... I know we fixate on these moves of stepovers, doing all these things, but they come out naturally in the game. And also we fixate on the fact that they need to be able to dribble left and right footed. But if you make it dynamic in nature, the movements, they have to do that anyway. They have to use both their left and right foot. And we need to do that from a, from an early age um, and and give them the confidence to be able to... If you put them in games they may not even find the favorite foot that they use. They might actually develop both feet at the same time. It, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think um, for me, I mean, you, you're the title of what you're researching is immediately attractive, adaptive dribblers. So for me, that isn't dribblers that are able to perform pre-prescribed movement patterns that they've rehearsed in isolation for, for thousands of hours, uh, thousands of repetitions. It's, uh, it's individuals who can manipulate a ball to solve a problem, which might be eliminating a defender, two defenders, three defenders in different parts of the pitch, in different scenarios. It's the ability to carry the ball to achieve a certain purpose. Um, I fundamentally think that if somebody, if a young player comes to a game of football with an idea that one of the things that they can perform is a step over, they are then going to be immediately detuned to other things that are really important in terms of football interactions. So one of the things you've identified as being a reason to carry the ball or dribble the ball is is either to be able to uh, get to a position where you can then give the ball to someone else. It's either to eliminate a defender or it's either to find enough space to be able to then make the next decision that needs to be required. But if you're thinking, do a step over, why do I do a step over in order to eliminate defender? That's going to, you're just going to detune yourself from those other options. Yeah, you're limiting, you're exactly, you're, you're limiting yourself in terms of what you can do. Um, and and I, I haven't delved too far into that, but I, I, I agree with you. You're, you're detuning, if we want to call it that, or you're, yeah, you're, you're limiting your ability to, to see all the opportunities. Have in, in your kind of preliminary research before your, uh, I'm, so I'm assuming you're kind of at that stage where you're still doing the kind of experimental design stuff. You haven't quite got to the point of data collection yet. Yeah, so data collection. Hopefully, um, once I get my ethics back um, in the next month or two. But yeah, in just looking at things and mucking around and and doing these things, normal training. Um, uh, there's another game that we use which has eight goals involved with eight players and. Um, you, you play that, and I've filmed that multiple times, and players won't do any stepovers because the goal's there. I need to get past the defender as quickly as possible to get to the goal. Now, doing a stepover is potentially going to slow me down, so I'm not going to be able to get past that player quickly. And, like, I see it all the time with some players who, who have got those stepover moves. They get past the player, and then they slow down. They do the move, and then they beat him again, and then they go again. And I'm like, you're yeah. past the player. Go to the yeah. goal, mate. Score the yeah. goal. <laughs> so yeah. it's almost like I did. I did my thing. I did my <laughs> technique, and now what? <laughs> yeah. Look, if if like you look at some people dribble, and like Ronaldinho is an is lots of people say he's probably the most exciting footballer, or was the, one of the most exciting footballers to watch play, and that probably comes down to a form of life as well, and the way yeah. that the Brazilians play the game. It, it is an, a form of entertainment. For them, everything is about the entertainment. For Ronaldinho, it was, he had this belief of, I want to entertain everyone here. I want everyone to be happy when they watch me dribble. So that's why they did the moves. Um, and like, if that's the way that you look at success, if that's how you're going to manage success, then that's a great way to do it. But if, if that's not how we're managing success, so we've, Maybe sometimes as a coach, we can say, okay, we're going to manage success on who can come up with the best trick. But other times, it's about actually completing the goal and scoring. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, like if we look at the success criteria, maybe. Because Ronaldinho, he'll do rainbow flicks during the game. I mean, mm -hmm. that potentially isn't, like you don't see that very often anymore in the modern game. Um, 
but he was definitely a player who could who just pull stuff out. Even Neymar sometimes he takes the takes the Mickey out of people, but he's he's got that form of life. And then you watch some of the English football, and it's just back four, boom, bang it long, up top. <laughs> the the interesting thing as well though is that I um I see scenarios where um when we're developing um individuals that fascinates me is is i always it it fascinates me how uh, some some elite player um will perform an action and then it's almost like that's the permission needed that 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 others can do that (laughs) so like the, the the one that um that really resonates with me is the the sunny bill williams you know kind of sidearm offload yeah um you weren't allowed to do that before it's like if you did that, a coach would say, "Don't do that, don't do that, son. Uh, use two hands because it's safer." And then Sonny Bill starts doing it, and now everyone's allowed to, and it becomes yeah. like a, a core technique that everyone should do and learn. And I'm like, it just fascinates me how, like, you know, you see like the the Cruyff turn and all that. So Cruyff did that once. Okay, that's something we're going to teach people to do. <laughs> and the, the best thing about that is Cruyff talking about it. Like he's yeah. like, oh, it's a great move, but he's like. The reason why I did it was because it was the best solution for the situation I was in. I'd never had practiced it before. Um, yeah. I think that's a really powerful thing that he's saying as a player. And, and you ask Sonny Bill why he did that. Well, because that was the best solution in that moment. Yeah. And I have the yeah. freedom to be able to do that. And we need to give that freedom to, to everyone. And it, it comes back to that, uh, once again, the form of life. And I think I think it was Mark Upton who, who talked about, he wrote a thing about... Um, in Brazil, I not make the captain, and everyone gave me a high five. In England, I got punched or something like that, or or, or taken out. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You don't do that. Yeah, it's the, <laughs> it's the cultural, it's that cultural aspect that comes into play. Uh, did you ever read um, uh, Ronaldinho's letter to his younger self? No, I haven't. Uh, be worth digging that out because he talks a lot of what you just said around his kind of his upbringing and you know what his parents said to him about the way he should play and the way he should embrace you know like you say creativity and and entertainment and and you know kind of being himself and all those sorts of things actually quite a fascinating insight into um, not only his own in his own sort of uh, psychological makeup but also some of his some of his career Um, yeah it's quite interesting Um, so just just flicking back to the research so um in terms of some of the preliminary reading you've done i mean imagine you've done a bit a bit, a bit of delving into the literature is there anything from either other sports or world of football or anything like that 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 we could um point to that is um kind of uh indicative of what you think you might find in terms of a hypothesis um yeah th- there's obviously lots of lots of stuff out there um, there's been there's been even some stuff at QUT. There was a guy called Dominic Orth, and he looked at um, crossing and the position of defenders when crossing the ball in, and how that um, impacts the way um, people do it. Uh, and there's obviously been a lot of research into small sided games um, and how that impacts on it. But a lot of the time, it's looked either it's looked at in um, it's looked at from a physiological side of things, so heart rate, the fitness, conditioning, um, and now more and more people are starting to look at it um, from a behavioural aspect and how it inf- influences behaviours. Um, in terms of the research that's out there, is like if you look at anything that's got Keith David's name on it, it's got um, you'll be able to find some things. He he's he. He sums it up really well when he talks about the fact that we're looking or what we're doing as coaches to develop adaptive performers. That that's I mean the best to perform is the adaptive one. What one of the one of the things that um I mean I was very fortunate that um I have been able I was able to sort of work alongside uh, Rick Shuttleworth, um, you know, who is um <laughs> uh you know is obviously one of um uh keith's um students and is working in lots of different domains worked over in in your neck of the woods um uh, i think in fact i'm pretty sure he studied at either qut or uq didn't he uh potentially yeah i know he was yeah. at the ais and he, he's been all over the, i think he was in new zealand maybe when he started oh, right. his study 
yeah, yeah, that's right. So I've um, I've been working alongside uh, Rick when I was at the the RFU working in rugby, and you know been able to sort of absorb a number of the the concepts. But uh, one of the things that definitely resonated with me is the idea of adaptability. Um, and he, and Rick had a big influence on the development of the kind of uh, player development model that they now uh, they're now following within uh, English rugby. This idea of cards, which is creative, adaptable. Um, resilient decision makers that can self-organize that is now the kind of philosophical underpinning in a very simple and easy way to uh to to kind of reference that kind of coach education and everything else is sort of based upon now and developing uh, coaches that are able to uh run activities that foster creativity foster adaptability foster resilience um so it's an interesting it's it's an interesting space and there's quite a few quite a few sports doing some some very similar things around this idea of I guess adaptability and creativity. So when your research comes out, I think it will be very very welcome. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, I need a yeah, I need to get it out first. I need to get everything done and go through the steps and the processes. Um, yeah, I think the, one of the difficult things for me in research is um, the more you read, the more your ideas change. So yeah. <laughs> you've got this, you're reading, you're reading, you're reading, you've got this idea and then you have to change it and you change it and change it and yeah, it, it's like hard to stay on the same pattern and it's hard to, for me to, um, sometimes I get side, very sidetracked and go down the wrong rabbit hole and it takes you a week, you're, you're gone for a week and then you come back, okay, this is what I need to focus on now. <laughs> I think the great thing about what you're doing, though, in terms of your research, is really applied. So, I mean, one of the challenges, I think, for the research community for quite some time has been um, being able to make enough connection with or, you know, kind of get get messages resonating at the, you know, at the coalface, so to speak, because, you know, the vast majority of coaches, I mean, certainly in the in England, you know, there's just England alone, there's um, there's 2.6 million coaches. Um, a vast majority of them, 66% of them, are voluntary, entirely voluntary. So yeah. the idea that these people are going to delve through, um, you know, nonlinear pedagogy as a book, <laughs> it's just not going to happen. <laughs> I mean, it's one of the reasons I think the coaching community should be so indebted to you because you know you've taken what are really quite deep and challenging issues and been able to articulate them in a two to three minute you know uh you know kind of video that puts across some of those uh, uh areas um in a really kind of readily accessible way and i think people could could take that on board but what you're now doing is following that up so you're saying right i know all this stuff now i'm going to test it in an applied setting to see whether some of the ideas that we're working on um actually make a difference to these individuals and i actually think that'll give an awful lot of people um the uh, the sum of, again comes back to confidence you yeah. know people want to grasp this stuff but it's almost like you know it's a leap of faith at the moment because we haven't got quite enough applied applied research that can support uh the kind of taking those steps so um you know like i said i think there's uh it's going to be really interesting to see it come out yeah and that that idea of confidence is is also awesome because i've been i've been working with a few coaches a couple of my mentors even um and when I work with them, I'm always challenging them. And I know they, that sometimes my challenging can be a little bit frustrating because um, I've always got a question or something to say or um, <laughs> I'm just that kind of person. But um, I've seen themselves, I've seen them develop and start to, to get more into the ecological and they'll say to me, oh, I couldn't believe it. The changes that I saw when I saw, saw this game, I, was t I had a phone call with one of them and I play this game where um, it's actually my mate from Spain who, who we kind of, I talked to him about it, but... He um he told me about this game where if you want people to face forward when they're receiving the ball or get away from the defender so he's not right touch tight in your back, if they get tagged in the back, then it's a turnover when they receive the ball, if that makes sense. So the pass comes in, the person who receives the ball, if they get tagged in the back, then it's a turnover. And it's, it's everything that's really good about constraints. You've got feedback there, you've got the actual feeling of the touch, you know that there's a player touch and then there's a consequence if, to try and change that behavior. Um, yeah. And one of my mentors took it in and he worked with some girls at the school that he was coaching. And he said, another coach came over and said, I, how, like, are you coaching these people right now? Like their body positioning, everything's perfect while they're playing. And it was just from that one constraint. And he said he couldn't, like other coaches were watching and couldn't believe what they were seeing and how he could do that without not saying anything. It was completely emergent. So those kind of, um, 
examples when we've got people having a crack at constraints, other people watching and going, wow, that's that's amazing how he's doing that. That's where we need to get to. And it gives you confidence. It makes you feel confident about this is actually a good approach to use. And the, the I mean, it's a fantastic story um, and something that I think um, I've just another one. Thank you very much. I'll be taking that one away. Um, the But the interesting thing about that is, is that it, it the beauty of that is once you've unlocked that, once you've found it as an idea, it it's the beauty. It's so beautifully simple. It doesn't take lots of, um, you know, uh, dialogue. It doesn't take lots of, uh, you know, kind of uh, conversation stopping. It doesn't take lots of, you know, interaction between uh, me and the individual talking through the appropriate movement and all those sorts of things. It's literally there is one task uh, or one kind of, you know, rule, you know, which is not to get ta tagged by the person next to you when you're receiving the ball. And that brings about a behavioral shift that is really desirable and it just happens in front of your eyes like it's magic i mean that for me is like it's those moments i've got to be honest it's those moments that i'm kind of a bit addicted to yeah for sure and and the thing is it's like it's still goalkeepers it's still a game everyone's having yeah. fun they're enjoying themselves there's it's i'm not coming in and talking to them they know the rule i think the one thing that is really important is that you make it competitive and you you make sure that the rules followed through on so sometimes when i watch people just starting with constraints they're also, and I, I do this, actually, sorry, I do this all the time as well. I'm confused at what I'm watching at times because it's just chaotic and I'm trying to figure out, but you've got to make sure that you, you stick with those rules. You make sure that the rules come out because if you move away from those rules and it's not competitive, the behaviors won't emerge. You won't see the behaviors that you want to emerge. And that's definitely something that I see quite a bit as well is... The other thing, the angle on that I see as well is, is that I see an incongruence between um, certain aspects of a session. So it might be that there's a kind of like a micro game, which is focused on a particular action. Um, and then when we go into a bigger, more chaotic game, one of two things happens. Either there's too much chaos and therefore the action doesn't emerge. Uh, and there's not enough opportunities to actually perform that action. Or the other thing is um, the emphasis that's placed on the bigger game doesn't afford the uh the action that you've just been working on in the micro game so yeah. when i'm giving when i'm having those kinds of evaluation discussions and coach development conversations with coaches it's the area i tend to focus on the most yeah it, it's important and um we're actually uh, where i'm coaching one of the coaches that i'm working with at the moment we're working a lot on um the information and how we give information and we're working with intentions and feeding forward information through video. Um, mm. And we played, a, they had a game last night and we played through a few clips before the game and we were reflecting on it after and they were, it seemed at half time they were a bit confused about the clips and we asked them about the clips and we were talking about today about the fact that maybe we just need to have the one clip and we just watch the one clip and then we work on that throughout the game rather than the other things will develop as well, but maybe it's a bit of a rush. We're rushing with the intentions. We're we're feeling a bit of um, pressure from the outside to try and get lots of things coached. Um, yeah, and and that can happen to a lot of coaches all the time. I I in certain situations you're like, okay, I want to. It's it's not. I think it's easier with younger kids not to get into this, but when you're with older players, um, that kind of fifteen and up age bracket where performance is becoming more and more important and you're becoming um like winning is is in a way becoming more important at those ages in in certain teams um you you can have that so so cultural pressure that comes on and, and it does affect the way that you coach even like a simple thing like we normally got one of the players to do the halftime talk um but in the last couple of games we haven't had that because we've been losing at halftime and we've there's been like even it's subconscious it's not even a conscious thing that we've said it's just subconsciously we've just gone in and done the the um halftime talk rather than getting a player to to do it so yeah it's everyone's on on a journey and it's it's constant reflection and emerging as well that um that whole form of life thing uh, around the the environment constraints placed on the coach so mm. the, the form of life that they have in terms of um, the dynamics of the 
uh, <clears throat> experience that they're providing and the performance context um, I think is absolutely essential and quite misunderstood um, so it's easy for example for say somebody working in an academy uh, to be you know very kind of ecological in their approach because there may not be um, the performance pressure um, and therefore there isn't a need to maybe you know kind of focus on certain things and try and get things kind of um, ticked off so to speak um, uh, but if you're in a if you're a kind of more community context then you're playing in a in a league or more importantly let's say you're playing in a school where there's either um, you know school pride or in some cases you know there's actually quite serious outcomes in terms of school performance because school sport in some contexts can be quite important in terms of recruiting recruiting people to come to the to the school particularly in a private school scenario yeah so there's quite a lot of pressure on coaches in those environments to try and perform and you can so it's totally understandable that you see certain behaviors what i find myself doing and I, that's the question i get a lot when i work with people in those environments how can we marry the tension between those two those two dynamics the need to perform but the desire to help players develop and learn it's quite misunderstood particularly by a lot of governing bodies who have an ideal of oh we should all be straight ecological we should let people in you know we should be emergent all those sorts of things well in that context that really doesn't resonate mm. however i do think there are ways of doing it if you're skillful and clever but it does take quite a bit of um quite a bit of talking through not going to cover that off in the podcast because um, that's the sort of thing that needs an awful lot more discussion but i just think it's an interesting thing that people need to probably be a bit more aware of yeah that, that there's a balance there in in certain environments there is a balance and there is a level of informational const constraint if you if you want to involve that and the idea of intentions where as a coach you might have the experiential knowledge to understand and the knowledge of to help someone understand a certain concept that's happening in the game. So you can, in some areas, it, it is important to give the informational constraint, especially if they can't see the opportunity. And there's more research coming out about this. There will be more research coming out. Um, I think, yeah, yeah, there is definitely, I think Ian's even written a paper coming out soon or has been published, I'm not sure. But it is about um, cognition and, and things like that and the idea of intentionality. Um, which is something that we miss and something that a lot of the time gets missed in the ecological approach. Um, and I, I know I, t I tried to touch it on with one of my videos called Intentions and I shared it on Twitter and it was, um, what I think the, the phrase I used is there's cognition involved in direct perception or something like that, which yeah. every ecological scientist would like look at or, and go, what are you doing, mate? Like an ecological psychologist would just be like, Okay, you can't really marry those together, but on the, or at least the way that I went about it and saying it, but there's intentionality that that then produces the behaviours as well and and feeds into it. Yeah, and that's been one of the criticisms of um, some of the research community that are, let's say, I'll describe them as say sceptical about mm. the ecological approach, which um, is or... completely understandable because if you look at a majority of of the work, it's it's done from um, the systematic approach or the indirect perception approach so uh, and cognitive psychology and look to be honest I'm only at the very start of my research so I probably don't have the le the depth of knowledge to say one way is better than the other um, I've just been put in the situation my own context my own form of life been in the situation where I've gone down this ecological method and the e ecological approach and I probably do need to spend a bit more time looking into the cognitive approach and understanding more about cognitive psychology. Um, but one thing that always gets me is a lot of cognitive psychology stuff is is in the code like computers. It's this yep. people are computers. And that, that idea I, I just doesn't work for me. It's yeah, just I, a, I... it's a personal thing. It's it's just the way I am as a, the way that I view the world. I I don't think I can look at a person as a computer. It's a very dominant and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it's a very dominant kind of narrative um, and one that you will hear played back so often in all different walks of life. But it's also one that's I think very difficult to break because. Um, 
it's kind of so in, it's so intuitively it intuitively resonates with people. Oh yes, the brain is basically just a uh, computer made of meat, and um, you know there is input and there is output, and you put this input in, you get this output out. It's 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 pretty. People work it that way, but um, and and have to say, um, I you know I've heard Keith talk about this, and he's often said that um, that there is uh, there's never well he certainly feels that there is never a um, there's never been an attempt certainly in his research to say that cognition isn't uh isn't uh, involved in the ecological approach um i th- i actually think it's a terminology or a, a definitional challenge because i had a debate with somebody about this uh recently who is i would say probably um certainly aligned to the kind of cognitive um uh, uh, uh way of viewing things and and i sort of said is that it depends how you define cognition we're getting pretty pretty into it now but um, so so for me and again I'm, I'm doing this with a bit like you really you know a rudimentary understanding of the different concepts but yeah. based on the understanding that i have the way i look at it is i think they're just talking slightly different language so i think we're talking about i think in the ecological approach we're talking about embodied cognition um uh which is essentially you know working the other way around where experience then informs uh informs action without necessarily it involving i mean it obviously involves the central nervous system it obviously involves it to some degree or another the brain but it's working outside in whereas the cognitive approach for me is always the 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 brain is almost like the central governor and nothing happens without the brain say so and I actually think that there is obviously, you know, so one is a thinking process, one's an experiencing process. So this idea that the central nervous system almost is its own brain, the body is its own brain, is something that I'm really interested in discovering more about. Yeah, for sure. I I think um, Gibson, even in the early part of his book, in his work, he looks at the idea of, or he defines what the ecological um, scale of analysis is, and that's what we need to keep thinking of is ecological psychology is looking at it from an ecological analysis framework or idea. Um, And that's a a different idea or different analysis to whether we're doing it from a chemical or chemistry um, analysis, or we're doing it from a physics analysis. So um, I think that's also something that can be missed. Um, and and look, it it's also comes from us, from the people who are providing the information. We miss out on on certain um, ideas that are really deep and hard to, and the nitty gritty that sometimes is hard to get into and hard to explain. And look, there's it's hard to say that there's an answer. Um, as long like what I say to a lot of coaches is, as long as you've got a logical justification for why you're doing what you're doing, then I can I can get along with it as long as you have a justification of underpinning why you're doing it yeah. and for me that that's a great starting point um, uh, you, you make a really good point there i think um you know you could it's better to have a um kind of almost like a, a theoretical justification or a philosophical standpoint and be wrong than to not want to have at all not to have one at all yeah and look it's it's hard to say which one's right and which one's wrong uh, Definitely, yeah. I, I'm not. I'm not judging which one is. I mean, yeah. I've got my stance. I could be wrong just as easily as anybody else. Yeah, and I think, and and that's one of the things with opposite direction. Um, that I don't know. Sometimes in my videos, or even when I talk to people, I get quite passionate about it because I'm passionate about this idea. But it's not to say that other ideas are wrong. It's just this is what I'm passionate about. This is the message that I share. Um, and. Yeah, I, I've I have that constant debate in my head about how I go about it, and I know that sometimes I get very passionate about it when I'm explaining it. But ultimately, it all comes back to me is the feeling that I have when I play backyard games, and that feeling that I had when I that emotional connection that I had when I played backyard games now has this theoretical underpinning. I'm connected to that more than anything. If I went away and then got connected to um, information informational processing or, or that kind of idea my world will crumble around me <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're right that that's the thing for me as well and it's one of the things i find so difficult i try and be 
as much as I possibly can. I'm trying. I mean, th- this podcast is an echo chamber. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm ha- totally comfortable with that, and I think I'm probably gonna. I'm not gonna have much of a, a choice, but I am trying as much as I possibly can, like you know, to to be as balanced as possible and to look into alternative viewpoints. And I'm I am hoping to have some some people on the podcast in 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 time to be able to explore some of these different concepts. But I kind of find myself because I'm like you. I'm so um almost like emotionally connected to the experience that i had and i want to provide for others that i find it extremely difficult to uh, embrace these different concepts because their sort of fundamental underpinning around human development just don't resonate with that sort of philosophical underpinning that i have yeah yeah it's well it's fascinating it's fascinating that that um, that emotional connection is it's to me very fascinating so we we've uh, we've been going at it one an hour and ten minutes, um, and actually probably about an hour and forty five with all the technical hiccups. Uh, and I'm I'm very conscious that it's getting later and later at your side. I'm actually more conscious, uh, just purely selfishly, Ben, that my children are outside throwing snowballs at each other, and I'm not able to join them. So the big kid in me wants to get out there. Um, but I'm, listen, I'm I want to stop I, that. <laughs> I have enjoyed absolutely every single second of this conversation. It's long overdue. Um, I would like you to make me one promise, which is as your research um, unfolds and as you start to find some stuff or you get into a point of publication, that you'll allow my audience to be uh, one of the first to hear about some of your findings so that they can start to apply it. Um, I don't know if you can, I can make that deal with you. <laughs> For sure. No, I'm... Uh... I think I'll definitely use opposite direction as an avenue to um, to start to share the ideas that I, I I start to find myself, and I'll show videos and and that's one of the other areas that I can use opposite direction for um, to share my research and and to get it out there because I I want it to be accessible to everyone. Um, academic papers are not accessible to everyone; they they just aren't. Um, it it takes a lot of time to sit down and read twenty five, thirty pages, or eighteen pages of um, and it, it isn't it isn't for everyone, and I I understand that. It wasn't for me. I like going through university. Oh, I couldn't think of a worse thing to do. Um, so I, I want to be able to make it accessible to as many people as possible, and and I want to have conversations with them, and and that's why I I, I see on um, I've heard in the past when you've had conversations with people about the terminology and how we use terminology, and that's really important as well is we can't lose people because of the terminology we use. We need to either, and and at the same time, it's important that we don't change the terminology too much because then we change the meaning. So yeah. we've got to educate them to the terminology in a way that's accessible and then yeah. they'll buy into it and, and we can develop the program and give them the confidence to, to have a crack and see what it goes. But to all the coaches out listening, uh, I'm not here saying that the ecological approach is... Um, 100% the best way to go. It's the way that I believe in, that, I, that I'm passionate in, and that's why I share it. And and like all good scientists, you're busily trying to disprove your own philosophy and your own hypothesis. Yep, for sure. <laughs> hey, listen, um, before we go, um, you mentioned Opposite Direction, so people can find you if they look for Opposite Direction on YouTube. They'll see there's loads of great stuff there. Uh, is there any is there anywhere else that you're uh, you're you're putting material out, um, or any other ways in which people can get in touch with you if they want to find out more? Um, so I'm on Twitter, um, just Ben Galloway on Twitter. Um, I think oh, I, my Twitter tag. Oh, I'll send it to you soon if you can put it underneath in the description. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and then my email address. Um, for anything coaching related uh, is ben.oppositedirection at gmail.com yeah your twitter handle is at ben underscore galloway eight okay perfect yeah if, if people want to get in touch um, yeah for sure brilliant um okay I, I, like i said i'm uh, very uh, grateful for your time um keep Keep doing what you're doing. Keep putting the stuff out there because uh, I find it valuable. I know the people I, I forward it on to find it really valuable. Um, like you say, what you're doing is you're demystifying concepts that would otherwise be inaccessible to people. And I think um, you know uh, people will find will find that really, really useful. 
and um you know i've definitely I, i've embedded a couple of your videos into some of my coach education presentations because it saves me an awful lot of time just watch that um <laughs> so uh you, you're doing a great you're a great job for us as coach edu- for those people who are out there as coach educators as well so uh very very much appreciative uh keep keep it up and uh, i look forward to chatting to you in uh in the near future and having another conversation like this Awesome. Thanks, Stu. Love the passion. It's awesome to be around the, the community. It's, it's a great conversation that we've started and everyone's jumping in and being on board. So awesome. So there you have it. Really enjoyed that conversation with Ben. Um, fantastic to hear, you know, stories. He's still in the, you know, that, the early stages of his, his journey as a coach, but hugely passionate so passionate that he's sharing information with others uh, sharing what he's learning putting it out there onto youtube and and driven by you know that that sort of intrinsic desire to try and provide children with the same sort of experience that he had as a child which definitely resonated with me so really enjoyed that conversation and uh, and and all the best to you ben thanks so much as always um I really appreciate you all listening. Um, if you're if you're liking what this uh, this podcast represents and the information that you're getting, uh, I'd be really appreciative if you uh, took some time to consider uh, a review on iTunes. Always really helpful in terms of helping other people find it and grow the audience. Um, and also, if you want to go that little bit further, um, I have got the, uh, the the supporter button on the website, the Patreon button, which um, enables you to become a supporter and to to really help. Uh, help to sort of build put the podcast and, and keep it going um, I have got a few spots opened up on in the conclave which is uh, the two mastermind groups that I have that meet um, meet once a month um, and there's some really interesting people there and some really passionate and committed individuals who uh, have all come together and we're all learning from each other and we're all uh, sharing our experiences some fantastic conversations that get into even more depth than the sort of stuff you hit on the podcast if you are interested again go over to the website uh, and uh, and hit the patreon button and you can see the conclaves and you can join there in the meantime have a great time out there uh, in either the snow or the heat or wherever it is that you're doing your coaching and uh, Uh, I'll uh, see you next time.